Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zeki Hassan, and I'm here with my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, it's good to be back. Uh, thank you always, listeners, for listening. And uh, we got some great feedback on the last few episodes. Uh, it was great doing them. And uh, we're super excited about this week's or this episode's guest as well. Yeah. And and uh, we are here recording at Hub 925. And uh, our guest for this episode is Lisa Ahmed, who is a well-known person uh, in the Muslim community here in the Bay Area. Certainly, uh, certainly uh, her culinary mastery has been a fixture and I can speak to the fact that my closest friends who live in California, Brian Hall and Sean Coyle, uh, whenever they come to visit me, okay. the first thing they ask is, when are we going to Mirchi's? That's a true fact. Two that, white dudes from <laughs> Southern California. The, the whitest white dudes. They <laughs> love their Lahori burgers. Aww. That means more than you know. <laughs> I always say that it, it truly is the reason I'm still doing what I'm doing. That's so. amazing. Awesome. Well, and and uh, just uh, by way of background, Lisa was born in the Bay Area and vividly recalls visits with her grandparents to their family's Italian restaurant, Lucia's. Yes, that's right. Uh, where she had her first taste of understanding the hard work and devotion her grandparents put into their restaurant. In 2004, she had the opportunity to create the business she had always dreamed of and Mirchi Cafe opened for business September 1st of 2004. And as that's I right. said, it has been a fixture in you. the Bay Area. It is a fixture in my family. <laughs> And Pervez's family. Uh, so, Lisa, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So, um, obviously, um, we kind of already uh, teased or talked about Mirchi's Cafe, and we'll definitely come back to that. Sure. Um, but, I mean, like we often like to do on the episode, um, or actually kind of a funny observation, um, you know, this episode do- didn't follow our Godfather conversation. Because mm. that would have been interesting, given oh. Lisa's. <laughs> it would have well, been almost too much. It'd be a little too bit much. too much on the nose. Too on the nose. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So <laughs> we intentionally pasted, it, you know, spaced it out so that Lisa wouldn't follow, follow this conversation God. around <laughs> around the Godfather and have to give into those. Yeah, well, yeah. you know that Italian kind of history does follow you. So. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of that Italian history, so you're you're a Bay Area native. That's right. Born and um, raised. Born and raised, but um, the family comes originally from. Well, so on my dad's side. Yeah. Um, originally, originally, they come from Italy, um, but my even my grandfather was born in Massachusetts, and even his father was born in Massachusetts. So I am four ge- fourth generation on my dad's side, but then my grandmother's mother Im- immigrated from Sicily. Okay. Yeah? Sicily. Yeah. My, I'm sorry, my father's mother. My oh, grandmother. Okay, okay, she, okay. No, I'm confused. <laughs> Suddenly, this is too much. Because <laughs> we already said the, so on, the fa- on the father's side, you're four generations. So basically, my yeah. great grandmother on my yeah. dad's side, mm-hmm. his mother, mm-hmm. her mother, right? Right. And she was born in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and then on my mother's side, so here's the thing: she always says that she gets left out because she's not Italian. So <sighs> I am. I am actually half Italian. <laughs> we don't like to talk about that, though. <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> so I'm letting you all in on a secret. Yeah. But um, she's got German, Scottish, um, oh. French, um, a bunch of European blood. Yeah. And so that's a whole other story. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. So it's funny you mentioned, because again, I pardon the stereotype, but no. like you, you mentioned Sicily and New Jersey yeah. in the same sentence. There you sentence. go. <laughs> so my mind goes to the Sopranos and goes to all kinds of other pop cultural references. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but from a historical um, point or um, yeah, from a historical perspective, w- was the early concentration of Sicilian immigration to the East coast and maybe specifically to <laughs> I'm Jersey? Almost certain of that. I don't yeah. have any statistical <laughs> 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 proof. Yeah. Um, but so my Just great anecdotally even. Yeah. My great grandfather, he ran like an Italian market. My my grandmother stood on a little stool, or what would you call a milk crate, back in those days, mm. to help service the customers when she was ten or twelve. And she never, she literally grew to four eleven in adulthood. So she was always a petite one. Mm. Uh, and I grew up listening to those stories, you know. And um, and then of course, you know, growing up, I was three when we opened Lucia's, um, and just being a part of the back end of a restaurant is very powerful i think for a young girl or a young person huh. yeah. so? so it's it's a completely different experience like when you go into a restaurant you sit down you're served it's almost like you believe what's happening it's like you're watching a movie uh-huh. and you believe the movie's real right mm. like you know when you watch a movie yeah. and you get sucked into the story and then you're like a part of it so i feel like in the restaurant industry especially more with the table service experience yeah you feel like you're a part of this 
this story going on in front of you. Mm -hmm. But when you direct a film, I'm just assuming based on how I feel about running a restaurant is you know well, that Zucky can maybe chime in because you know, right. yeah is, I know and yeah. I really didn't mean to do that but literally <laughs> that's a great it just analogy kinda, it's a great metaphor so you know you're yeah. really seeing all the bits and pieces the moving parts and so suddenly it's not it's not that kind of smoke and screen thing you, you get to see the the good stuff and the bad stuff and and I got to witness all of that I the saw the struggles and is lifted the yeah veil is lifted. absolutely yeah, saying, yeah. absolutely mm. yeah so it was an impactful experience um and Lucia's is an Italian restaurant. Full on. So, yeah, yeah my grandmother used to make the raviolis by hand uh, oh, when we first wow. opened. And it was... Where was it open? It was in Fremont. Okay. 700 Maori Avenue, which is now a dental office. So I drive by there and it's just a really strange experience. Sure. Like, oh, that's my past. Wow. You know, that existed. It's still there. It still huh. looks the same, except for it's just not. And hmm. um, it's, it's so a part of who I am that I still have dreams that I'm in that business and I'm working in it. And usually I'm at the soda fountain and it's overflowing and there's problems <laughs> and people are <laughs> yelling for me. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. how many years was it in business? Uh, 28 years. Yeah. Amazing. So, and so you are not only a Bay Area native, then you're also still uh, like a Fremont? So I was born in Hayward. Okay. I was schooled between Hayward and San Leandro. I see. So I never went to school in Fremont. Yeah, but mm. my grandparents lived in Fremont, and that was the connection for me as a child with the restaurant. But okay. my other grandmother, who helped raise me with my mother, um, because my mom and dad divorced when I was about mm, five or six years old. And so my dad was very much a part of my life, and that's why I was at the restaurant all the time. But um, but I kind of, I'm between San Leandro, Hayward, and Fremont. Huh. All Alameda County, and I mentioned that only so. because Alameda County is certainly a <laughs> part of the family lore as well, right? Absolutely. Because your father is yeah. in law enforcement. He still is. He's you actually, right. yeah, he's uh, under sheriff for Alameda County currently. And that was always the case. So you always had no, a law. Oh, no. Oh, I yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. So he, he was a Hayward police officer for many years. Uh-huh. And then he left the industry for a period of time to work for my grandparents' left restaurant. the force. He did. He left the force. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just had to throw, we've never had a guest where we've, been able to throw that those kinds of terms well, around. So our family's sure. big on Star Wars, so <laughs> <laughs> no, we're big on Star Wars, but using it in another, terms of the police force. So, yes, this yeah, is another yeah, conversation. Yeah, so my father left to go back into law enforcement um, in 1994, and so he's now you know currently under Sheriff Alameda County. Yeah, and my brother is also a captain at Alameda County. My nephew is a a deputy, and so it's definitely a part of our family heritage, you would say, you know. So, uh, before we tra- travel the road to, to Mirchi's restaurant, yeah, talk mm-hmm. about tra- you are the road you traveled uh, to Islam because absolutely there's that intertwining there, <laughs> it all does, everything really does connect. But um, I mean, and, and I think giving us additional context sure. to the Italian roots would be, I guess, absolutely. Me Catholic. Yeah. Well, so oh. I think, again, because of the divorce in my family, there mm. was a disconnect in our religious kind of the way that we lived our religion. My dad is Catholic. My mother is not. Mm. Um, she just has my on my mother's side. It was more just a belief of God, but without any religion. So my grandmother would always say that, you know, she would say, oh, I you know, pray to God. But she didn't have like a basis of a religion in which she was praying with. And so she believed in the prophets and she believed in God, but she didn't have any construct to kind of live that religion mm. or that thought or belief through, you might say. So or my mother. Christology or Trinitarian doctrine no, wasn't really yeah, big. Yeah. No, they weren't. And so, again, it's a lot of conversation that I'm trying to, you know, put in smaller bites. But um, my grandmother was um, orphaned at age 10. So her mother passed away suddenly from strep throat. Oh my God. And then a week later, her father had a heart attack and died. And so I think that had a lot to do with just her understanding of any formal like religion. And my grandfather was born Catholic, but he, you know, he just kind of followed my grandmother's ways, which was just not to go to church, but to believe in God and live a good life. Mm. And so I had that experience. And then I had my grandmother on my dad's side who was Catholic. She would take me to church. And there was a period in my teen years when I started to identify myself, even though I didn't, I didn't, I was baptized as a Catholic, right. but I never really 
pursued that part of the religion. It's First communion, all that kind nothing, of stuff. No, 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 no because no, you no. have to go to cl- classes for that, right? Okay. But the funny, not funny, that's not a good um, way to explain it. What's interesting for talking about my journey to Islam is that from a very young age, I was very interested in knowing God. So as a little girl, we did celebrate Christmas and Easter and all of those traditional, you know, um, festivals. But I would get these little Bibles in my, again, we we didn't go to church, but I, my mom would put these little kid Bibles in my basket for Easter. And I just really was like excited. I didn't read it, but I really was like, oh, it's something about God. Mm. Or she was searching a lot in my when she divorced and then she would search a lot, you know, trying to find God in the way that she could understand him. And so we looked into all kinds of religions. Um, And in each of those experiences, I was excited to meet him. And I remember that clearly, or I would go in my bed at night and pray to him. Or if I did something I thought was wrong, I would be afraid and I would pray and ask for forgiveness. But again, no construct to put it to. Right. right? Right. And so I just believe that's part of the way I was created, to, that I had an urge to know him, and I didn't have any confusion in that wow. by God's grace. And so it's, it's like what Dr. Almer says, you know, like human beings are homo religious. Like true. we're just innately created with that, with that uh, sort of nature of wanting to search for God yes. or find God. I feel that as yeah, well. Yeah. I feel that. And so I was in, um, I guess I was in ninth or 10th grade. And it was Islamic history at college, excuse me, at high school. Huh. And I was working at my family's restaurant as a waitress. And the first person I knew as a Muslim was my husband, who then was just somebody I was working with. A pa- oh, he was working there. Yeah. So my, yeah, that's a whole story. Oh, please, <laughs> you want please. To go back. So he's from Pakistan and he was born and raised between Karachi and Lahore. So he considers himself a, a Lahori, but um, because he came there when he was about 10 years old. And, uh, but he immigrated to America at 20 okay. and that was his life dream to come to America and mm. he would, you know, dream about it. And, you know, that was just something he really wanted to do. And his first whole, of his family, first yeah. of his family. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So he broke away from the pack. Um, and his intention was to care for his family, like to send money back. And they came from humble beginnings and, um, he has a large family. He has seven sisters and two brothers, one who's living and one who passed away from epilepsy when he was 19 or 20. And so he came with a real strong purpose of providing. And his brother, his older brother also was providing, but he felt like he had done so much that he wanted to take the baton and run with it because he had seen his brother was 16 years older than him. And so he had been doing it for a long time, helping the family. And um, I met him, to be honest, like very soon after he came to this country because he had three jobs. One job was at Papillon's in Fremont. And uh, the second job was at Lucia's. And then the third job was at um, 7-Eleven in the middle of the night. And he owned a bicycle and he would ride from place to place and work literally, you know, day and night. And he did that for a few years. And it's funny because you would assume we're 10 years apart. So I'm 10 years younger. And you would assume that I wouldn't have remembered him at age 10. But there was a moment when he took our order. I was, it was like a family dinner at the restaurant Mm -hmm. and he was our waiter. And as a young 10 year old girl, I was more used to seeing, you know, Caucasian, African-American and, you know, maybe Asian faces. And so his face just looked different to me. Mm. And I remember that specifically. Mm. And that was that. I mean, that's where it ended. Of course. Right. (laughs) And we had two restaurants, by the way. So we had the Italian restaurant across the street, literally across the street there was the fish house and so i worked on the fish house side and he worked on the italian side <clears throat> excuse me and my little brother who's three years younger than i he was also working at the restaurant and again you might ask why are these young children you know 13 and 10 working at a restaurant but my dad and mother were divorced and we were at my dad's on the weekends and my dad thought it would be a great kind of experience for us you know to work with him right so that's how it started um and so my brother would come home and, and just brag about, oh, my best friend Mush, and we played Frisbee out in the back, and I made salads for him. And I, you know, so he was really excited. And I was 13. I was like, who's this dumb Mush guy? <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it started. We then closed and we had to close up the fish house because at that point, the fish prices were kind of rising too high for <laughs> what we could kind of wow. sell. Yeah. And so it right kind of course. closed our business. Okay. And so I started working at Lu- Lucia's. 
And then we worked together. I was 15. And so that's when I was learning about Islam in high school. So we're going, you know, okay. back to yeah, the yeah. story that right. I was starting. So I would come into the restaurant and like, guess what I learned today? And, you know, we weren't um, very, what would you say, close friends at that point because I was so young. But I was the boss's daughter. So, of course, he was going to, you know, like politely listen to what I had to say, right? And my grandparents loved him dearly. So he was like a second son to them uh-huh, in a, in a way. Like they, they really just accepted him and my dad respected him. So it wasn't a big deal for him to conversate with me, you know? Yeah. And I was also more mature than an average 15-year-old because of my circumstances. And um, actually by 16, I had moved out and uh, into my own apartment. Mm. It's a very long story <laughs> that you can't do anymore, right? I mean, yeah, nobody right. could afford at 16 to work at a, at a restaurant. And, and, and live in an apartment. Certainly an, not yeah. in the Bay Area. Not in the Bay Area. No, <laughs> no impossible. So, um, so you have to understand, it's, it's not like I was living in a mom and dad kind of home setting mm-hmm. and starting a, rel- a romantic relationship with this guy, mm-hmm. you know, and, right? It wasn't like that. Yeah. He was more like mentoring me and, um, and I was a p- bit persistent, you might say. And so I said, um, at some point within the, like six months of us conversating, and he was just a very listening kind of guy and just kind of laid back. And that attracted me, to be very honest. So I said, well, why don't we just get married? You know, let's get married. And he said, no, listen, it's not that simple. You know, like my parents, they might be difficult for them. I'd have to go to them and talk to them. They're in Pakistan. And and I said, well, that's okay. And he goes, no, I, I send them all of my money. Like they are number one. You would have to accept that. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And he said, and I might be going bald really young because my brother's already bald. <laughs> and I don't think you want to marry a bald guy. And I was like, no, I'm totally good with all of that. And so he was going through his process of getting his green card. Okay. Um, and yeah, it sounds crazy, but my dad actually was like, oh, you know, you you know, you know, can marry my daughter and get a green card, you know, because they loved him like a son and Dang. they saw the struggles that he was going through. And he said, no, I don't want to marry her for a green card. I need to get it on my own because huh. if I do marry her, I want her to know I married her because, you know, I wanted to marry her. Right. Huh. <clears throat> and then he did talk about the Islamic peace and he's like, you know, I don't want you to convert for me. Okay. If you're going to convert to Islam, it has to be for Allah. So right. I just want to pause for a second because I think you, you've touched on so many like just fascinating things. So one, you know, like your husband's experiences are sort of that, you know, quintessential immigrant experience, three jobs, yes. you know, maybe even going to school or whatever may sure. have been the case. Yeah. You mentioned Seven Eleven. I mean, like my father worked as a Seven okay. Eleven, putting himself through school. Yes. You know, and so I, and I, I imagine. And so th- those are just shared experiences of the Absolutely. immigrant community. And I think really paints a picture of that of, the, of those folks that immigrated here because we're talking what seventies eighties uh, yeah um, eighty five right and yeah. so you know hard hardworking just salt of the earth just doing That's whatever right. needs to be done to not only make ends meet but more importantly like in the case of your husband again you know to send money back That's home right. and support a family yeah and, and live on whatever is limited. That's right. To what he had. Right. Well, when we when we finally married, like I was like, okay, you have to buy clothes because all he had was working clothes. Oh. Yeah. He didn't have. There was a waitress in our restaurant that used to sell guest jeans for like discount because they were like donated to certain, you know, like churches and such, mm-hmm. and they had little flaws in them. So like he owned a pair of those and they were like ten dollars. <laughs> oh. So we went out. Not like he couldn't purchase it for himself, but he just never thought to do that. Wow, right. It was right. not about him. It was really all about his family. So that was one thing I, I couldn't help but reflect on or just at least pause and acknowledge. Sure. And the other thing is, you know, we talked about movies and whatnot. I mean, yeah, y- y'all story is like <laughs> a screenplay waiting to happen, like yeah. waiting to be written. Yeah. Right. I mean, that they sort of beautiful little love story. You know, yeah. th- there's a family restaurant involved. I mean, absolutely. You, you got to think about. Well, that. I'll be <laughs> honest with you. I've always, I'm very proud of my story, yeah. and I don't say that because I believe I have created it. I truly believe God has gifted this to us. Hmm. And so, when you don't own it yourself, you can be proud of something, right? right. But if you're proud of something that you've done yourself, it sounds a little egotistical. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited that I have this beautiful story that's God. You know, God wrote God, the screenplay. Yeah, he yeah. truly did. <laughs> He truly yeah, did. And, yeah. and the piece that um, I think I have to mention about with my journey to Islam mm-hmm. is um, during that period of moving from my mother's home to my apartment, there was a lot of struggles between us. And I 
she did her best, you know, so there's no, um, it's just, I was a difficult teen and I was kind of acting out and I yeah. wanted to be on in my own terms, you might right. say. And so when I had approached her on that, she was of, of course devastated. Who wouldn't be your 16 year old child wants to move out. Right. Mm-hmm. Of course. But I took it from a standpoint of she's not supporting me in my young 16 year old mind. And so we had an argument. I have a 16 year old and believe <laughs> you know me, she's like. listening to this. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it probably on a weekly ba- basis threatens to move out and, or, or, or threatens that she can't wait to move out. Sure. Of course, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, but at least now in today's context, we have the, 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 like the response of, well, you couldn't afford to live as a That's 16 That's right. No, now it's impossible. But back then <laughs> back I had then, a plan. You could actually pull it off. <laughs> I had paid, I saved up and my dad was going to transfer my $300 child support to me. And that was the plan. And I was going to work full time and go to high school. And uh, so long story short yeah. is we had an argument and she went into her bedroom and I was left in the, the you know our apartment family room. I was just devastated. And I didn't know anything about Islam except for the historical piece that I was learning in school. Right. right. So I had not been taught prayer. I had not been taught how anything you might say. Right. In that moment, though. I dropped to my knees and I went into sajda, which is the prayer pose when one touches their head to the to the mm-hmm. ground, right? Prostration. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I begged God to help me. And I was just sobbing. And I was just in a devastated state. I was just beyond, I had nothing for myself. I was just begging him. Like, I don't know what to do. This Nothing is working for me. And um, And then I got up and I walked out of our apartment and I called my father. We didn't have a home phone. Um, again, it was very tight means in those days. And so I went to the payphone down the street and called my dad and he picked me up and then started, you know, living on my own. Um, and it was really beautiful times. My mom and I patched up quickly. She understood and ultimately that it was best for me. Yeah. And then that's when my husband and I kind of developed our relationship and married very quickly. He went to Pakistan. He had finally gotten his green card through um, working on a farm. Okay. And so it was the Farm Act in which he applied. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So he went to Pakistan and approached his parents with my picture because you know, no no cell phones back then, right? With the uh, <laughs> I was going to say that, like you mentioned, having a home phone as being a thing. I mean, yeah. my, listeners today are probably listening to the show and like, I don't have a home phone. But, <laughs> what is the idea of a home phone? But we and had then a pay walked, phone. <laughs> and then you walked across the street and went to a pay phone. That's What's right, that? So, for real. So talk about the time we, or yeah, this right? sort of dating ourselves here. But um, yes. not having a home phone in the 80s, folks. I mean, that was a big that, deal. That was a big deal. It was and a so big when deal. you talk about limited means, you know, right. it's a basic utility that people have. It'd be like right. Allah today not having electricity in one's home. That's I right. mean, honestly. So, yeah, yeah. Because it was just generally seen as a necessity That's or right. a utility that you had to a have. Refrigerator, not having a fridge. There you go. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So just want to put that no, in context. Definitely. But um, So he goes to Pakistan now. He's able mm-hmm. to travel because right. of the green card. Yes. Um, And so probably returns for the first time after a number of years. Right. Right. After living in America. Yeah. Um, uh, and again, talk about the quintessential immigrant story, the story for so many people who can't return home, even yes, if they want it. That's right. Um, and so, yeah, so talk about that. So then he goes there and he yeah, says, he goes there with my picture uh-huh. in hand and I fall to pieces over here. I lost like 10 pounds of depression. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was a, <laughs> it's a really long story and I'm really trying to condense it. I think, no, no, of course, you know, it's, but it's, you know, there were players in my life that, um, that didn't necessarily understand our relationship and, and they didn't think it was going to work out. So it was like, oh, he's going over there to get married. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was devastated. So I had one of his best friends call his brother's house. It was just such a silly scene, you know, where and back then there was no, you couldn't call direct, right? You oh, had yeah. to call through this number and it was just a whole big drama. Again, talking about dating ourselves. Here, right. Yeah. And, and certainly back home, Everybody did not have a phone. No. You had like almost like a neighborhood That's phone. Right. Yes. It was either in someone's house or at a was some sort of commercial. Sure. At that point, my in-laws did not have a phone. That's right. And so yeah. you would walk and go get yes. that person and right. you'd hold and then they'd come. and That's right. And then you'd have to, you know, speak about, you know, speak at a higher <laughs> decibel so that they could yeah. hear you. That's right. Now you got WhatsApp, right? <laughs> <That's> right. So <laughs> And there was Facebook. a rotary dial. That's right. That's- so you, you, it was like a 10 minute process just trying to dial, <laughs> just to dial the so number. funny you say that because I was just reflecting on it. I had a almost like a two hour conversation last night with yeah. a friend of mine in, in Istanbul in yeah. Turkey. Uh-huh. And it's through, it was through WhatsApp. Sure. But I was just, I, we hung up and I, I was like, first of all, I was like shocked. It was two hours yeah. had gone by. 
But secondly, I was like, do you know what this call would have cost me in the 80s? So, like, yes, it's just unreal. I mean, I couldn't even dreamed of calling Turkey for two hours. It no. would have been like a month's rent. That's right. Yeah. No, we we all have other stories which I won't share today. <laughs> no, 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 please. So we I, had some I, visitors that did call Pakistan with, you know, without thinking of how much it cost. And <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, and then uh, you're left to foot the bill. And right? that's right. Yeah. That's right. But um, so I call and 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 you know the housekeeper answers the phone and I don't speak the language. I don't know what to say. You know, it was just like hello is mush there <laughs> you know he's like yeah yeah <laughs> he's like what what yeah, <laughs> right so i gave up on that and then he finally called me and i was like are you getting married i heard you're getting married and he's like no i'm not and i showed them your picture and then he didn't tell me the whole story okay. up until later but basically my in-laws cried for five minutes and then you know understandably right their son comes home from america with the picture of a white girl <laughs> who's not muslim at the time yeah. and it's like what <laughs> what are you wow. doing and why are you doing this but then my sister-in-law had just a beautiful thought and she said i'm gonna make istikhara which is a specific prayer to get answers or mm-hmm. guidance from god and so she did that that night and went to sleep and she saw a beautiful dream with green and, and white. And Your husband's sister. Okay. One of, yeah, yeah. who's still um, one of our most trusted. And uh, I've got two beautiful sister-in-laws that live in, in California and they both work at Merchi. And oh. I believe the baraka that they bring to Merchi is something that you couldn't possibly wow. replace you wow. know, with anyone else. Yeah, that is So beautiful. she told my in-laws, like her parents, like, yeah. it's all good. Just tr- trust in God. And so they did, mashallah. And they really did. Like okay. they really, really did. When I when I first so he came back home, we got married in July. Um, again, how much information do I give you just because of time? But I was underage, I was seventeen. It made no sense for me to get married at this time. And but my parents were completely in agreement because they saw that I was I moved on to another phase in life and they're like, What's well, better she gets married mm-hmm. to somebody that they really like, mm. right? Then go and fend off for herself in their minds. You had graduated or I just graduated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just graduated yeah. and um and, and at, up until this point you're still not Muslim. No, yeah. I'm not Muslim. I actually converted um the, like I took my Shahada the day of my nikah. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. Wow. So we had to go to a judge. We had to go for counseling. My parents had to go to the counseling. Uh, Mush had to go to counseling. Of course, I was the main sp- focus. Like, have you, are you being sold and <laughs> are you being abused? And all wow. of that had to be cleared. Wait, huh. this was like an imposed counseling? Like, it wasn't just counseling. No, it's you part were... of if you're underage and yeah. you want to get married, they want to make sure that you're not oh. being forced to get married oh, in, okay. in, in America. So, yeah, it's a whole process so you have they to go will, through. So they will recognize the, the marriage as long as you fulfill these. Correct. And right. the judge re- reviewed our case yeah. based on the recommendations of the counselor. Uh-huh. And then we got the green light. Got it. It's silly because I could have waited six months. I could have, let's be honest. But yeah. I wanted to be married on July 20th. When you're 17, no. you know, you're just not, you're not thinking about what, what <laughs> makes sense, right? <laughs> it's all about how you feel and <laughs> what you want. And, <laughs> and I really wanted to be married July 20th. That was my day. <laughs> and that's the day we got married. And um, we did have two marriages. We had like an American yeah. non-denominational wedding with the white dress. And it was important to me. Mm. That was the dream that I had in my head. Right. And, my, and, and again, Mush was just very open to honoring you know who i was rather that was than before like a judge or a magistrate or it was, was we it, hired, hired someone, someone who was officiate yeah, them. that's right yeah. exactly and so it was lovely and it was very simple it was actually in Wybell area in fremont it used to be Wybell winery because my grandfather was very good friends with the that family and so it was a plot of land completely barren <laughs> and we just got married up on that and now there's homes that are hmm. built <laughs> where we wow. got married you know wow. on mission boulevard if you go towards uh, 680 okay yeah okay. okay anyway so we got married and then a few months later we traveled to pakistan to meet the family and uh, because no one was able to attend from his yes, side yes exactly okay exactly wow. and yeah. so you got to talk about that experience. I mean, so you oh, land in Karachi that's where the or Lahore. Movie. That's yeah, where the yeah, movie that's part comes in. The movie's it's been in my playing. head. Oh my no, gosh. No, the movie's been playing. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. So yeah. we are about to land. Okay. We're looking down at Lahore and it's pitch black. And I'm like, where are we landing? Huh. I don't see lights anywhere. And he's like, oh, it's called load shedding. It's the way that they, you know, conserve energy and water. 
oh, okay, I don't know what to even think about this. And I've been really ill. This has been a long flight that I've mm. never experienced, right? Had you traveled back to I've the traveled, home country no, prior to that? You had never no, been to Italy or no. Sicily? Okay. This is my first yeah. big travel. Gotcha. And okay. I'm still 17. I'm, I'm approaching 18. Got it. I actually turned 18. You married 18. A, few men, a few months then. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so um, we land. And this is before Lahore had the newly built airport. So we had the, you know, staircase coming off the airplane. You get to the bottom and there's two guards with their guns. And it's just like shocking for me, right? It's something I've never seen in my life. I've seen on TV. And uh, we get in this bus and the bus has no lights either. So it's still pitch black wherever we are. And there's these two guys with big guns in the bus. And I'm thinking those guns could just go off for any reason at all, right? This is scary. But I'm just riding with it. You know, when you're that young, again, you're not thinking too deeply. I'm just being honest, you know? (laughs) If we did, we probably wouldn't do all that we did. Um, That's right. Right? right. My brother-in-law picks us up from the airport. He's the only one in the family with a car at that point. And uh, drives me to my uh, to our in laws, and as I'm sure you're familiar in Pakistan, the front of the house is the front. So the front yard is the backyard, what in America would be. And so mm. there's a gate to, mm-hmm. you know, keep that private. And there's so there's the big gate, and you can open for the car to drive through. But then there's the little gate that you can walk through, is right? right. And so the little gate opens. It's still pitch black everywhere. It's about one in the morning at this point, mm-hmm. and. I step through and you have to kind of put your head down and I look up and everybody, there's at least 20 people standing in front of me with candles. So it was the most beautiful, Beautiful surreal moment. And my mother-in-law steps forward and grabs me on both cheeks. And I'm not going to (laughs) cry because I get really (laughs) emotional. And she grabbed me by both cheeks and she just kissed my forehead and gave me a hug. And my father-in-law came and he had tears in his eyes and he just put his arms around me. And it was literally in that moment, I was their daughter. Oh. And it never changed. It was Amazing. always from that moment like that. Wow. And then we sat in the family room. Was there a language barrier? Or, of course. Or did they I speak still, no, no. They didn't speak English. No. Yeah. And you know, you some of my no nieces and nephews, because right. again, my husband's nine of 10 children. So he has some nieces and nephews. He's 10 years older than I am. People, now that, that's an interesting dynamic that people don't realize with these right. big families, especially in the subcontinent, is yes. you'll, you'll have. You will have um, nephews and nieces right. that are the same age as some of the younger siblings yeah. of, a, of the earlier generation. Absolutely, I have that on my mom's and dad, or well, my dad's side specifically. Okay, he also came from this big family of having like six aunts and you know one uncle, and so you know some of the children of the older siblings sure. they're as young, they're as yeah young or yeah yeah they're, they're like as close old in age, as right? The younger siblings That's right. of the earlier yeah. generation, yeah. Just, Fascinating. It is interesting. I mean, it's become pretty commonplace in my life, right? Over the last, right now it seems normal. But yeah, yeah, in that time, it was like your nephew from your brother is only a few years older than me. Right. (laughs) So you guys are a few years, he's a few years younger than you. So they grew up like brothers. Right. And they're different generations. Exactly. They're they're uncle and nephew. Yeah, he's an uncle and nephew. But they're best friends and they're like brothers. (laughs) And so we go and sit in the family room and everyone's speaking Urdu. And of course, I don't understand a word, but I've been trying at this point. So even prior to converting, um, like I stopped eating pork. That was the very first step I took personally. Okay. Um, And then I would like ask questions like how do you say this and how do you say that and i was so yeah i really wanted to be a part of the the conversation i talk a lot so i no. thought no i do and and i'm like how could i be out of those conversations not possible <laughs> right <laughs> and so i sat there and everybody was talking talking and then the lights came on okay boom like three in the morning boom it just they come right like out of nowhere you don't expect it and then everybody's eyes are on me and mm. everybody has a smile on their face and it was it's hard to explain. It's really hard to put into words, but it was just so welcoming. Mm. I think that's the best way to describe it. And then my my sister in law was really hungry because I hadn't eaten on the airplane for like the twenty four hours, and um, I, I, I taught her how to make a scrambled egg because <laughs> they either make fried eggs or omelet, right? Yeah. But I just wanted a scramble. I want a simple scrambled egg, you know. Right. So she's like. Geek your head. What is yeah. that? <laughs> I was like, okay, so you take the egg and we're like using my, you know, she can speak a little English, but of course I'm using a lot of like body language and she's using a lot of body language. And I just love her for that. She just, again, they just embrace me. May God give them the reward that they deserve yeah, I mean, for just openly, right. you know, accepting this, this young white girl. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fascinating. Right? You never even think about that, but like, 
Yeah, scrambled eggs is kind of a, a novelty. Yeah. We don't use that in any of our cuisine. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's usually a fried egg or like you said, or a scrambled egg. Yeah, or omelet, yeah. Or, an, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. or an omelet. Fried egg or an omelet. Or an omelet, that's right. Um, yeah. But that is so I know. <laughs> and, and there is an art to scrambling an egg. There is, I, for real. I, I, I'm very, like, I, I have to explain this to my wife. I'm like, you have to, there's like, <laughs> that's one thing I'm good at. She'll tell you. She says you're not good at well, anything. Well, that and you're but, shy. <laughs> What, you, that and your chai. That, well, thank you. I, I do make a chai. That's right. I've heard. Um, I've heard. <laughs> that's right. So, so how long were you in Pakistan? That, that like that first. It trip? was a month. Okay. Yeah, it was a good four weeks. My husband hates to go there for a short period of time. He's yeah. like, "What a waste!" <laughs> I, I traveled so far. I, you know, I need to feel like I'm there. So, yeah. so we're talking mid '80s. This is now '91. '91. Okay. Yeah, '91. Going into we, I turned. So we were there in the end of 91, in Jan- or excuse me, in, no, I guess it was 92. So it was in January 92 okay. is when we arrived and we left um, like at the end of January because I turned 18, which is February 20th in Pakistan. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So from from then to Mirchi opening, mm-hmm. we've got. Yeah, I've got it quite a bit. You've no, no, got it. yeah. So, yeah. so we want to jump to that. Yeah. No, no, I'm not. I don't want to jump to that. <laughs> no, but I, mean, I can, I can, you know, step it forward. Yeah. But no. I mean, uh, not not so much stepping it forward, but mm. I mean, I think I think the road to the restaurant is what I'm most fascinated by. So it's it's definitely starting now, because this this is definitely when Mirchi, without it being known as something coming, but the base of Mirchi is 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 I'm experiencing it. Sure. Right. Because so I marry. I'm in uh, Ohlone College doing uh, fashion design, and that's what I thought I was really interested in. And and I'm planning my wedding, and I realize I'm going home. And I'm, back then, you can imagine there was no Food Network or any of these channels, right? Yeah. It was PBS, and it was you know Julia Childs, and you had um, the Frugal Gourmet. Frugal Gourmet. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I, was about to say, yeah. I loved him, <laughs> and I was so sad when he kind of like fell from his glory. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about it. Yeah, it was sad. Um, I had his book. I had a few magazines, food magazines. And I, what I would do is I would come home and I would cut out the recipes that I liked from the magazines. And then I made a personal cookbook out of it. And I would glue and paste it to, you know, um, what do you call that? Uh, paper, the construction paper. Mm-hmm. And I still have the book, actually. Oh, wow. Funny enough. And I, I realized, I'm, I mean, I'm it's still 17 at that point. So you can just imagine like, I'm a kid. Okay. (laughs) I thought I was an adult, but I look back, I was a kid (laughs) and I just started dreaming of food and I started trying to make cakes and then I would cry because they were leaning one side and they didn't look beautiful like they did in the picture. And I, my husband and I, once I got married and he's like, well, why didn't you know, go to culinary school? And I was like, I don't know. What do you think? And, and so that's ended up how we apply, I applied and, and then we went to Pakistan. And so that trip, Mm-hmm. I came home yeah. and then I started culinary school. Okay. So it was back to back. You know, you, again, I come from this Italian restaurant background. Right. Right. That profile of food is very specific. And that's what I grew up on. And then I had my other grandmother's cooking. And those were the bases of my understanding of food. And then we'd go out to Chinese and there really was no like what what was out you know in here we didn't have a funny we didn't no have back then. there was one indian restaurant at mm. two in fremont that i had not gone to until my husband you know introduced me to um it's still there taste of india and so um mm. my the dish i liked was the keema with anda the egg <laughs> and, <laughs> there's the egg again yeah there's the i'm yeah. telling you I'm, uh, <laughs> nobody knows what i i mean i don't publicize this but i haven't eaten eggs for eight years because right. of an allergy oh, so i wow. miss eggs terribly oh. yeah i miss my eggs but um, uh, let's see, I, I feel a bit off track, so maybe you can, I've got too many lines open here. <laughs> no, no. Well, yeah. well I mean, I, th- I think the narrative that you're weaving is a fascinating one because, sure. because specifically um, the, the way um, your journey sort of, life's journey in a sense started with sure. food preparations and that and, right. and sort of the circuits tripping where you're like, let's bring these two cultures together. Sure. So I experienced, so I'd come from the Italian background. I think that's the base I was trying to set. And then I enter Pakistan and Pakistan is an explosion of experience, right? Yeah. Not only visual, but flavor. Like I had Halim, which is kind of a, 
um, mixture of lentils and meat that are cooked together and then ground into a paste and it's topped with fried onions and, and uh, this lovely, you know, lemon squeezed on it and you eat it with the fresh naan, which is the leavened flatbread. You're making me really... Oh, I was about to say, I'm, I'm, I'm starving. I'm literally I salivating. Died. My right. brother-in-law was yeah. freaking out. He's like, no, 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 don't eat anymore. <laughs> You're going to get sick. Because <laughs> I was just going at it. Like, I was like, this is it right here. No. Or, you know, like we went on a little day trip okay. to the Wagga border. Okay. And on the way, we stopped at this Kimawala. He was just making ground beef mm-hmm. and uh, roti, which is a flatbread. And so we had a picnic on the side of the road, and I took a few, and it was fiery hot. I mean, sure. I'm not, it was not normal spice. It was like 10. And I, we were all trying, and everyone was having a hard time eating it. But, you know, those experiences, right? They were so powerful for mm-hmm. me. And so I came home. And you had never had the no. pa- Pakistani cuisine. Before. No, it was an Indian, like I said, taste of India. But yeah. if you really compare the two, there's I mean, really no. Not, yeah. not, no disrespect to the Indian cuisine. It's just that, that at that time in America, what was being offered, For sure. it was not as traditional. I would even argue even now because the ingredients there, well, when I say now, I mean, I haven't sure. been back to you know, the, the subcontinent in like 20 years. Oh but, my gosh. But back then, at least, I mean, you know, the, the ingredients are fresh. That's right. You know, so so that's just infused in, you know, it has a food. different flavor. It has a different flavor. There's no no matter comparison. how great of an Indian that's Pakistani right. restaurant you have here, Very true. Their, their raw materials are different. They are different. That's right. But no, what I find also fascinating, you know, this kind of insight that you have now trying these new cuisines and whatnot, what is kind of the, 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 the threat, uh, as it were, that Zaki sure. pointed out, is that you come from a culture where food is such an integral part it of the was. family. Mm-hmm. Dynamic. identity just cultural identity there you Absolutely. go I, it, it, me i.e italian and now you're and, you, and then you're now you're welcoming this new family right familial experiences which also food is such a part That's right. of the of huge the, yeah huge it's ingredient every, yes. if you will honestly yeah. if well you know so when my sister-in-law from my brother-in-law right so yeah you can say Bobby, right? Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm just one. Yeah, so my Bobby had visited, and I was still working at the restaurant, and I had eaten my dinner. I mean, you could say Bobby to us. You, there are listeners out there who might not know what Bobby is, Bobby but I'm is making like, it easy. I appreciate it. Yeah, so, no, no problem. So she was visiting, yeah. and I went. It was still working as a waitress at the restaurants before my culinary experience, and um, and I had eaten dinner. It was a late night, right, 10 p.m., but I came home, and she's like, oh, you know, I made this and this and that, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I just ate, but I could see it on her face. She was so right. sad. I felt so bad. I was like, I I didn't mean to offend you. I just, I'm just full. And I I realized in that moment how important food Mm. was, right? To the relationship of of us to understand each other. Yeah. It was very important. So I really embraced that. Um, And again, I think because of, and not to say it was, I mean, sure, it was hard with the divorce in my family. And and there was just kind of a break, you would say. There was like a divide in, in our family. And I so badly wanted to belong to, mm. to a, you know, to like a tribe. Mm. And not that I don't belong to my family, but it was just a bit broken. Mm. And so coming into this new family that was so strongly bonded. Right. And was, not just the nuclear family. Right. right. I mean, the, oh, you, the when extended. When you go to Pakistan, the extended. And, that's right. That's right. Now, are you spending most of your time this trip in Lahore? In Lahore. You don't that's go right. to I Karachi or no. Islamabad. We or did other. in the future visits. Right, we would go every year. Right. Um, even when my children started to come into the world, we would, you know, go with them. But um, once, m- once my second son was born, then my mother-in-law by that time had become a widow, and my sister-in-law, who had been widowed prior to her mother, mm. we decided we wanted them to come out here mm. and be with us. And because uh, we would leave Pakistan just sobbing, mm. it was like we couldn't bring everyone home, mm-hmm. right? But we definitely knew we weren't going to move in. And stay in Pakistan. So it was like we felt all alone in California. And I told my husband, let's bring, you know, them over here because like we yeah. can't live like this so lonely. What are our kids going to understand? Yeah. And he, again, he said, you have to understand what you're asking for, right? Mm. It's not like the American. What they you're live, getting yourself into. Right. You have a real responsibility now because you're bringing people into this country that have to learn from scratch how to live in this country. That's right. So are you okay with that? And again, I was like, yeah, and I, I'm i grateful for that entire experience. It's been, I can't imagine our life without them in it. I just can't. So I'm very grateful that, that they were able to make it over here. It's Beautiful. been yeah, a um, huge addition to our life. I guess, meanwhile, we haven't really touched on, but like what's what's happening on the sort of religious 
kind of experience yeah. from? I mean, sure. you know, you, you're in Pakistan now. Are are your in laws? Do they have certain expectations yeah, as no. to namaz party? No. You know, like yeah. all that kind of stuff. So right? that's the Praying, beauty of it. Quran. Yeah, yeah, yeah nothing. Uh-huh. And that to me, I think again, that was God's design for uh-huh. me. Because had it been the other oh, way around, I'm stubborn. Watch out! Like, don't push on me. I'm going to push yeah. right back. And so, nothing. It was just literal acceptance. Even when my mother in law came to America to live with us, like I was wearing capris and sleeveless shirts, and she never once stopped me and said, "I'm sure deep inside she was like, I bet you she was just praying the heck, <laughs> you know, like, mm. oh please, you know." <laughs> but she never showed it. Like I really didn't. I I was so clueless to all of that, you know. I yeah. really didn't even know it existed. To be very honest, and because I mean, Pakistani or Pakistan is not a monolith. You, right. You're also. What it appears to be the case is that you're, you're married into a family that's relatively traditional. Yeah, well, they like, were very I, traditional. Not I, modern, I, yes. not, you know, no, like, no. you know, because there's very stratas much. in yeah. Pakistan and mm, yes. the upper class, that's high, right. super educated or very westernized. For that's example. correct. Right. They had none of that. Right. At all. I mean, and really, and in, yeah. in the most beautiful of ways. Of course. You know, right. Right. like, yeah. And yet not to have those expectations. You know exactly. What I'm the, of the new bahu, of the new Absolutely. daughter-in-law. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I think it was just so God generous yeah, of yeah, them right, and right, God sent right, for sure. Course, but, if, but generous, yeah. So certainly. I would say the first 10 years of my Islam was very much cultural. Okay. That's how I lived it. Of course, did that mean I didn't understand anything? No, I understood the five tenet. You know, I understood. Yeah. I learned how to pray through my sister-in-law. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really excited about that. And so... Um, Again, there's there's stories to everything, but sure. I don't want to, you know, take all day long and be on here for five or six hours. Um, but the experience was in such very simple and slow paced, and it came as I needed it. Gradual. Right. Mm. And so it wasn't until about 10 years had passed that this big change kind of shifted. And I, again, I don't take credit for it. Mm-hmm. I truly believe it was God's design. Like he had prepped me for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, putting me through little, 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 right, little, little right. experiences, There's right? Deep, profound wisdom in that. Yes, it was beautiful. I'm so happy, right. to be honest, that YouTube and all of the internet, you know, information out there wasn't available Didn't to me. Exist, yeah. yeah, because I had a few books and those were important to me. And then I had my relationships with my in-laws. And to be honest, my Islam was very private. Got it. The first I was 10 say, years. Like, you know, obviously in Fremont, even at that time, I imagine there's a pretty big Muslim community. Absolutely. You're not we were not huge yeah. in that. My Got husband it. had his um, friends from childhood that had been able to immigrate, and they became our best friends. And my in-laws became, when I say in-laws, I mean my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, her two children, and then another sister-in-law came. And little by little, a few more family members were able to come over. That was our nucleus. So and so I could be who I was. Right. And everybody accepted me for it. I'm sure some people had some, like, you understand. But like, it was like, it, but it was so privately, like, they just kept it under wraps because huh. they saw my husband wasn't complaining about it. So they just, you know, maybe didn't say anything. But it was really that sort of <laughs> element of like, come as you are. Pretty right? much. Yeah. The whole Tetley <laughs> thing. The whole thing, right? 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then what happened was, is I opened Mirchi Cafe. Okay. And I don't know if you want to jump to that. No, but, no, we will certainly. Yeah. No, but I think what's also fascinating because, again, we've had conversations similar. Where someone embraces the faith and they have a horrible experience at sure. the mosque. They walk into the first mosque. I did have the bad experience. You did experience. have those. Okay, I yeah. thought perhaps because of the strong family unit, you were kind of preserved from I that. I think I still was preserved in that. I'll tell you what happened. So, okay. yeah, I did have experiences in like masjid one time. It was Eid. And I, we were all lined up for prayer. Literally like moments to like say Allahu Akbar. You know what I'm saying? Like it was right there. And some lovely auntie just whacked me on the back of my you know on my back basically because i had long hair and it like a little piece had come out of my hijab that i had just for the masjid nice. <laughs> and it just jarred me hmm. and i didn't i don't even know that i prayed i, I mean i stood there and i just i was in another place right. i was not in prayer hmm. and so i was afraid constantly of going to the masjid and then people would ask a bunch of questions and it was never about islam it was yeah. like Oh, do you speak Urdu? Do you cook Pakistani food? Do you like Pakistan? Do you? <laughs> and I would feel like it was this constant, just me having to prove my cultural identity, mm. you know? Um, but I will say that, yeah, I have a whole theory about Tet Leaf, which I don't know if we'll be able to, to like stick in, but please, it was a huge, please. it's still jumping really far ahead in my oh, journey. Okay, so okay, maybe yeah. we'll 
keep it on the sure. side burner. We'll put a pin in, yeah. a pin in it and yeah. then we'll come back to it. But we sometimes yeah. have a tendency to forget. So. I know, but I'll try. We'll make sure. I will. Lo- loop this it is in. a little easier because me so, yes. is yes. so much part of the. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's a huge piece of my growth. Okay. And I, just, yeah, I mean, what you're describing, it makes me think like did this person who did that. Yeah. Do you, like, do you think she knew? Like, if, no, ha, if she don't. knew. No. That yeah. because of that thing in right. her mind, I'm doing this she good did. thing. Absolutely. And yet because of that, you're afraid to go to the mosque. Yeah. That is just infuriating to it's me. It's pretty it powerful, is. right? It is. And that's why the, like the path to damnation is paved with good intentions. Yes. You know, I mean, I mean it's yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I can't even tell you. I hear yeah. that. And it's yeah. It it boggles the mind. It's like there's but a you know, way. There's a there's way a to way. have that you could have that conversation. Absolutely. You could let they could have let you pray. That's right. Say, hey, sister, I just want to exactly. let you know. Exactly. Uh, is right. that a hard thing to you know yes or you know it reminds me of this uh, the hadith right of the prophet's grandchildren and they went to the masjid and there was a man making wudu incorrectly that's right so did they run up to him and say you know hit him on the arm and say that's not how you make wudu no there's they said okay you go over and make it incorrectly and then i'll come and i'll correct you loud enough for him to hear you <laughs> you know and then he came up to them and thanked them Right, so there is adab. There's character, and there's 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 manners that you can in, elicit to teach people. But right. coming up and just, but again, I I actually was thinking about her the other day. Mm. Something came up in my head. Wow. And I mean, I can't explain. I don't know if I. It's kind of private, but I I did. I I forgave her because mm. I've been holding that in no, my heart important. for a long yeah. time. But I realized, you know, she probably did not know better. Right. And I don't want my weight of mm. how I felt about wow. it to affect her. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So I pray for her. And huh. I, she was an elder lady. So my guess is she's probably passed on by now. And that's mm. when I started thinking about like, you know, I don't want that to weight her grave. Yeah. My, wow. Yeah. That's a beautiful sentiment. Um, So I guess then um, you, 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 now the idea to start Mirchi's. Yeah, so what happened was is we came back from Pakistan a few times. We were still both working. Um, I went to the Culinary Academy. That it was its own experience. It was a two-year oh, yeah. program, right. and it was a full program with pastry and table service and you name it, the whole butchery, the whole thing. And then I did an internship at a, at a bakery in uh, San Francisco that no longer exists, um, lovely French patisserie. And then uh, we went to Pakistan again, and during that travel, my grandfather passed away. And it was a shock because he just passed from an immediate heart attack, like on the spot. And I couldn't get back for the funeral because right. Lahore had that, um, you know, fog in the morning and the planes weren't taking off. And so I, I missed that whole piece and I didn't get to mourn correctly. And so what I did was, is I came home and I said, instead of what my plan was, was to go out and work in the culinary world in different restaurants and experience that, right? right. But I got very emotional and I, I do believe there's a reason. Like, I don't feel like I missed out. On, on anything hmm. because um, I came to my grandparent and uh, my grandmother and to my dad. And I said, I'm at your service. What can I do to help? And they said, yeah, you know, we'd love to have you, you know, take on his role and not in the sense of being him because he was the owner, but he, he had certain tasks that he performed in the restaurant. And hmm. so I took that and I worked with my dad, my uncle and my grandmother, my brother. And then at that point, my husband was working with his, he still had his own computer business, but he would come and work at the restaurant because it just became a part of us. Right. It's, he loves the restaurant business. And so he continued it. And uh, so I took over as a manager. And uh, without that, I don't know that Mirchi Cafe could be. Hmm. Because um, yeah. if we didn't have the experience of managing a business, um, and I only had the cooking experience, it would have been very difficult to open your own establishment. Right, because the management is very different. It's all about, it, it, there's just a whole nother level. And right. and then you have my husband's expertise with finance. And so, you know, it was just like the perfect storm mm-hmm. to happen because money is not my focus. <laughs> I've been accused of that many times. <laughs> so now so, is there a period where the two restaurants overlap? Or, so or had no. Blue, blue, so, yeah. so what happened was is, I le- so prior to Mirchi, there was something called Mirchi, or excuse me, Sophia's Delights. Um, so I left my family's business. Um, my dad had left for law enforcement. My brother had left for law enforcement. And it was pretty much my uncle, my grandmother, my husband, and myself. And so I started getting itchy. I wanted to do something, but I knew I couldn't change Lucia's. Lucia's was an institution, and you just don't change something oh, like sure. that. Right. Um, so I left, and we 
we basically built Mirchi Cafe's kitchen where it exists in Fremont. Mm-hmm. And that was a, a catering company. I named it after my daughter, Sophia. And I run, I run that for two years and it was hard, hard work. It was really blood, sweat and tears in, in that little space because you couldn't hire help like, you know, a dishwasher. So who did the dishes? I did. And they were a lot of dishes. That was a huge like push for me to learn patience. It was like a mountain of dishes behind me. And I had just worked all day long, mm. right? Serving and, and cooking first and prepping before that. And, and then I had all of these dishes and I would just close my eyes and <laughs> just one at a time. And you mentioned Sophia. Like, I mean, you yeah. have, by now you have three kids? We have three children at that yeah, point. At that point, yes. yeah. yeah. So a growing family. Yes. I mean, not to mention after coming home from a long day, right. long long day, you still have. Yeah, I burnt myself out. That's... Now I look back, I realize no wonder I'm in the condition I'm in now <laughs> at 45. <laughs> Yeah, so so we did yeah. that, and then what happened was, is my family, my my uncle and my grandma, they moved the business to another location because the current location became a doctor's center, mm-hmm. and they didn't feel like they had a space there because they weren't getting a renewed lease. Right. So that was detrimental, unfortunately. And again, I got emotional and decided they needed help. Um, my my uncle came and was like, you know, what what do you think we should do? Mm-hmm. So I sold Sophia's delights to another. Pakistani gentleman, he took that over, and then I went back to Lucia's with my with Mush, my husband, yeah. and we tried for a year, um, but it was it had unfortunately people had lost their trust, I guess you would mm. say, in, mm. in Lucia's. So we all decided collectively to sell the business. Okay, and there's another part in that because once I had gotten back into it, my children, as you say, were a little older, right. and they started asking questions. You know, there's wine, there's uh, pork, and oh, I didn't even think about yeah, that. Right. And, and then, then as a Muslim myself, like... Yeah, you're struggling with that it, too. Right. So is that the only reason? I'm, yeah. I'd be lying if I said it was. The business was not doing well. But again, I think that's from Allah too. It was just wow. like, this is not huh. your time for this. You know, it's, it's not for you. And so that closed. And when Lucia's closed, suddenly I was without a, biz, a restaurant in my life for, from age three. Mm-hmm. Right? That's right. And I think I was like 29 at that point. And so... We would have, so my, my husband's family and I used to have dinner very, very often and really great time where we would just hang out at the table after dinner, have all of these conversations and it was just real family quality time, which I, even today, like we, we're all just so busy. It's not that we don't want it, but life has changed for everyone, you huh. know? Mm-hmm. And so in that, I said, you know, I have this idea. What about if we open this, this restaurant? And everyone was like, no way. <laughs> like, no, we'll do burgers, halal burgers, halal pizza. <clears throat> and, you know, I had this idea because my husband in Lucia's, he would make his own Pakistani kind of toppings, like kima, the, the ground beef, yeah, yeah. but spiced and put it on top of the pizza. So it started there. But then going back, like being in Pakistan, and as you know, there are continental restaurants in Pakistan, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And so I experienced that as well. So it was like, okay, here's Pakistani food, but then here's like, what I'm used to seeing yeah. in, in a different vein. That's right. Right? Like yeah. the club sandwich in Pakistan, which is now Shazan Club in Mirchi. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and why did I call it Shazan Club? Because I wanted to give credit to Shazan Restaurant. That's where I ate it. That's where I was inspired oh, by it. okay, okay. I believe if you eat something and you're inspired by it and it, it originated somewhere else, you need to give ode to that. That's beautiful. Right? You have to give respect to the person it's that brought a, it. a chain of transmission. Absolutely. Chain of transmission <laughs> Thank or, you. I, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking of like the, um, like a, a point you made about Coppola giving credit to the, um, the source material. Yeah. Like right. all of the, many of his Mario movies, Puzo's. Mario Puzo's yeah, The Godfather. Yeah, that's right. Had or, he just taken it on on his own. That's right. right? Or uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. There you, know, you go. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Absolutely. Sorry. Um, no, no, it's um, all, all part of it. It is. Right? Um, so the, so this idea of like maybe fusion. I like, hate the word. Yeah, fusion. I know you. Okay. I'm got sorry. It. No, no, that's fine. I'm I a layman. I don't know what it so is. No, excuse. don't feel bad. I finally given into it because it's like just easy. Like, yeah, it's fusion. <laughs> but why do you hate it? I'm curious. It was such a trend at, at, at mm. that time when we were opening. Yeah. It's kind of fizzled out. That's why I don't care as much. Yeah. But in that moment, fusion was like everywhere. Really? So, yeah. so when does the inspiration hit? Early 2000s, I'm assuming. Yes. So this is 2003, oh, wow. where okay. everything had accumulated from, again, right? That first experience in Pakistan, my yeah. culinary experience, my time in Lucia's, 
being with my husband in our home, experiencing this new culture that I was living, it all just kind of crushed together huh. in my head. And yeah. then I had this whole vision. And it, here's the other thing. Yeah, was it about the food in my head? There was a part. It was that Shazan Club I wanted to tell a story about. It was the shash, chicken shashlik that my Bobby taught me how to make. Mm. You know, she gets owed to that. I should call it Bobby's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, I didn't do that. Sorry, Bobby. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? So all of that was coming in my head because I had that culinary piece that I was just, I was just like, I, I passionately wanted to express it, but I still had not had that opportunity. The, mm. the, the catering was an expression, but it was also based on what other people wanted not on you know the ideas that i had brewing in my head and lucia's was a lucia's like mm. you just didn't mess with that so this came forward but then there was this other piece which i was like yeah and we can teach people about pakistan yeah right like this was after 9 11 right mm. there was a lot of weird things being said about pakistan that i'd never experienced nor witnessed and i was like i want to show people because at this point so when i first married you would say Oh, where's your husband from? From Pakistan. Oh, where's that? Mm. Right? That's 1991. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then post 9-11, <laughs> where's your later. husband yeah. from? Pakistan. Pakistan. What? Yeah. Have you ever been there? Yeah, actually many times. Are you Are you sure that's safe? Yeah, I'm sure. Mm. You know, it's complete mistrust yeah. of a country. And it drove me crazy. But talk about the shift. To, yeah, I mean, that's such a fascinating observation, too. Like, like just the shift of the conversation. Huge. Yeah. Well, you know, right. yeah, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we won't but, touch but, that but, one. But, but I, I, you know, look, a corollary I would draw, and I, th I think the fact, the, the, the what you're talking about, we can use this as an opportunity to tell the story, story. about Pakistan. And it's, yeah. let's invite people to come and break bread. Break bread. Let's, it's everything. You know, that's I mean, I mean, it. food tells story it's so important because it's a bridge mm. of understanding mm. and so my idea was let's have all of these pictures of pakistan in all different capacities right like the funny ones with you know then i added india too because i did want it to be you know it is it it has a story right it can't omit india from pakistan like there's it's That's all right. connected yeah. and so it was a combination of the india pakistan the cricket the you know, everything, the rules, everything that you can think about Pakistan, I tried to put it on the wall to the best of my ability. Yeah. <clears throat> and so um, I wanted people to visually in, intake this artistic piece of Pakistan and eating food that looked like American food, right? Mm -hmm. Burgers, pasta, pizza, right? Wings, it had whatever, whatever right? right? All that traditional comfort American food, yeah. but infused a, just a slight amount of the Pakistani flavors right. so that it wasn't overly encompassing of a burger, but it also made you think about new flavors that you might have not tasted in right. that, you know, type of a food. And so to me, that was like a bridge into the heart of somebody, <laughs> right? Because that's really like the heart to anybody is through food. That's right. That's you know, right. you feed someone well and yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's you know, I, I, I'm assuming your experiences were the same, Zucky. Like, well, when you moved here, Mirchi's was all, already a thing. Mirchi, no, because no. you guys opened in September of '04. That's right. So okay. very, I, I moved here early '03, right? Oh, so, okay. was, so right was, before, okay. shortly before. But, but I will say, uh, I mean, certainly for the majority of the time I've been here, Mirchi has always been a place. But I mean, uh, I look at it through my the perspective of my kids, right? My yeah. oldest is my oldest was born in 07. Okay. And we've been ordering from Mirchi all their lives. Sure. Right. And and yeah. I always think about that. I'm like, you know, they just take for granted right. that this kind of uh cuisine exists. That's right. And and it's you know, I just I I look at my own time as a as a kid. I mean, sure. you know, I grew up in Chicago and it's yeah. like, oh if we want halal food, well we gotta drive like an yeah. hour to it's Devon Devon's. Avenue. Sure. And right. have some you know But mostly ethnic food, right? Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. And and so to me that's so like it's just it's it's a a contribution to their lives that yeah. is incalculable at this moment, but it's gonna pay dividends yeah. for the rest of their lives because they're not gonna have that bipolar view sure, of, yes. of identity. And it's just because of yeah. this is one aspect of it. It's, it's because of the food they've been eating. Yeah. yeah. It makes me, like I said, it is what keeps me going. And I will mm. tell a story that I tell often, which is we had a, um, I was invited to a meeting at Mirchi and I was sitting next to a gentleman that I had never met. <clears throat> we got through the meeting and then in the end he turned to me and he said, can I, I just want to thank you for opening Mirchi and I mm. want to tell you why. 
And I'm like, you know, you hear that a lot. I won't lie. And I'm always touched. It's really, like I said, I'm not in it for profit. <laughs> this I can promise you. <laughs> That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> um, like, if you don't believe me, yeah, you know, here, here, here are my are bank books. statement. Yeah, uh, here are yeah. the books. <laughs> <laughs> believe me. That's actually coming. It's coming in the future, okay. but we'll talk about that yeah. later. Um, but so he says, you know, I grew up in Chicago. Mm. And my parents are Pakistani, and I never knew like where I like fit. Was mm. I Pakistani? Was I American? Yeah. Was I both? Like, what did that mean? And right. I always felt like I was an outsider in mm-hmm. both places. He said, and then I was visiting California, and a friend of mine said, like, "Hey, you want to go to Mirchi?" And he's like, "What's that?" And blah blah blah. Right. So they end up at Mirchi. He eats the food. He's in the environment. He said, and in that moment, I knew exactly where I belonged. Amazing. It was wow. amazing. That's, I mean, that's, that's like, I could just like go to bed with that and be like, <laughs> yeah. okay, it's been a great run. Like, you know, that's it right there. That's yeah. amazing. That's, that's no, it. I mean, as as also a fellow transplant to the Bay, like Zucky, but much later, um, 2009, you know, if, in, in Zucky, we've referenced it on the show. And obviously you and I always talk about this, but like even before I had moved out here, sure. I had visited, I'd done a few short visits. Yes. And Zucky and his brother-in-law and mm-hmm. my cousin, uh, it was like one of the, one of the, one of the sort of rites of passage, oh, yeah. even attempting to move to the Bay <laughs> uh-huh. meant you had to go and have lunch at Mirchi's. Oh my goodness. Yes. I remember you and Omar, right, right mm-hmm. name drop, uh, dragging me to Mirchi's and was like, okay, you gotta, you gotta check this out. So yeah. yeah well, yeah, I mean, right. just put it in perspective for me, cause see, like even it's been 14 years and we now have a second location in Dublin. And my my son and his wife opened a deli and meat shop in the Fremont location a few doors down, right? So you're seeing a lot of growth, but somehow in my head, I'm still on day one. Hmm. Day hmm. one. So I'll give an example. Yeah. In fact, I just had to take a picture of it because they, they took it back to the restaurant. But when we were purchasing for Merchi, okay, and I was going to start milkshakes, that was something I wanted on the menu. And my husband was like, Oh, no one's going to buy milkshakes, right? I'm like, no, maybe they will. And the mango lusty is good enough. <laughs> right? But no, he's like, nah, it's not going to yeah. happen. So right. the milkshake machine, we argued over uh, a single unit or a, th- a triple unit where okay. you can make three milkshakes at one time or you can make one milkshake at one time. Okay. So he was like, no, just buy the single unit. And I was really bugged. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. When you said single and triple, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so there's, but so we there's have an expert. three heads. But, but no, is that, I've is, seen the founder. So does that get into <laughs> like, does that get into like single, well, single malt and double No, malt? so okay. like there's literally three heads. Okay. Yeah. And you can attach three milkshake glasses mm-hmm. to whip up three separate milkshakes at one time. It's like uh, more efficient. Like, right. Uh, you, you can, volume, right? Increasing my volume. idea was you're going to have somebody order, you have a table of four. And they're going to order four milkshakes Uh and you have to make four milkshakes. So if you're doing it one at a time, it's going to take a long time. Scalability, volume. Okay. So he was like, nah. But but then I am curious, what is the the double versus single malt or whatever? Those are different. Yeah. Okay. What is that? I'm just curious. Do you know? Single malt. I mean, as far, I think, I think I... I know malt is a powder. Okay. 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 And that so gives maybe flavor. that has something to do with it. But I maybe. think double and single malt, it's also maybe a beer thing. <laughs> it's a little oh, different. <laughs> okay. But, I, you know, I could be wrong. All right. I could be wrong. But I know, no, 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 you no, no. know. Right. So, okay. so, anyways, long story short, yeah. we buy the single unit. Okay. And then, like, a few weeks in, it was obvious that we needed the three, <laughs> you know, the three headed unit. So I brought home the single unit to remind myself. To remember to like believe in me, oh, that's believe awesome. in you know what I feel it's like my gut instinct does have value, <laughs> and so they just took it back to the restaurant after 14 years because something broke and they needed to use it. So I tell them like I need to take a picture of this <laughs> if I can't have it. Really <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So there was uh, just imagine that. So that's my mindset. Right. Like I'm still struggling with that. Right. That, no, you know, people are still not going to accept it. People are not going to understand. Oh, that's what you mean when you said you're still in that day one mindset. hundred yeah. percent. I mean, we would, we would sit in the empty restaurant and I would be crying. Mm. I had tears and I would mm. eat those madrasa fries, which, you know, that's how it started. I was depressed and I would go in the kitchen and I would drown my fries in ranch and hot sauce. And then <laughs> the kids at the masjid who were memorizing Quran, uh-huh. they would come in and they would see it and then, it's madrasa. So then yeah so we <laughs> named the madrasa prize because it's like in honor of the madrasa students <laughs> who, who started like you know it, it, we were joking about this being a movie but this seriously yeah but, seriously you know, i mean someone really, needs to write this yeah, yeah i think yeah. it's fantastic yeah. Yeah. actually t- a little tangent but no, uh, speaking of movies have you seen chef yes 
Now, you know how like lawyers watch lawyer shows and they're like, that's yeah. not how it is. And right. so when you watch Chef, are you like, that's not how it is at all? I mean, I feel like there's yet to be a movie that I, I feel like um, Spanglish mm-hmm. was as close oh, interesting. kind of mm. to the reality no, of what. Remind me, Chef? Chef? John Chef Favreau. is John Favreau's movie. Okay. Yeah, I love that movie. And mm-hmm. I think that, yes, to to the high-end restaurant degree, sure. I'm, I've just never experienced that. Sure. We're like mom and pop shop. Um, and I feel like their experience on the truck like uh-huh. was a little bit like you know, unrealistic. <laughs> one thing I'll say about, about that film, though, and specifically with the truck, there was a scene yeah. that really touched me. Uh-huh. And it's where... Uh, he he's having his son like prepare oh, the food the and, and he kind of grilled just, cheese one? yeah and he kind of yeah. just half asses it and and he says oh that, that one yeah he's like no you, this is this is you take pride in this Big, like yes he's like oh it's just a sandwich he's no, like no yeah. it doesn't matter if it's a sandwich on a truck and you yes. take pride in it and I because I went and saw a press screening of that and okay. I was in the city I was at the Metreon and I had to hurry back and so I we leave I leave the Metreon and there's like a you know the, the food court area sure. in the Metreon there's like a crepe place I'm like let me just get some fast and. The fast food. I'm watching yeah. her prepare the crepe, and I, I'm thinking of the film. I'm yeah. like, that is her art. That's right. Like yeah. she, you know, yeah. for her, that's the pride. You know, and yes. and we don't think about it. Most people oh, don't. I, yeah. See, don't. for me, it's a struggle because, um, what you know, I I really love everyone who works for us. So I don't mean it in any negative way. Yeah. But you have to teach people that. That's right. Yeah. Sure. They don't on the whole. Right. And I do believe, like people from culinary school. And people, there are people who do have it from start because it's just their passion. Mm -hmm. But when you're kind of like just making ends meet, Mm -hmm. you're not like, oh, this is so beautiful that I'm making the sandwich. It's like, I just came from another job and now I'm on job two and I'm tired and I got to make all of these sandwiches or all, right? And so, but it is the fuel of good food. Like it has, Mm -hmm. the intention does infuse into what you're, you can taste it. You know, the other part of that film is when we're talking about films is he takes his son to the farmer's market Yeah, and he, he gives him kind of what food was it? I don't remember what the actual dish was, but it was some food. And he's like, you know, you don't eat this here because you want to eat this. You eat this because you ate it where it's originated and you want to remember what that felt like. Mm. Wow. You know? And to me, that is food. Like when people come into Mirchi and they want to eat something like a Lahori burger, they're not just eating the whole Lahori burger to eat the Lahori burger. They want to remember themselves in Lahore eating mm. that, you know, burger that is still not what I couldn't get it. Like you talk about, like I couldn't get it like it is in Lahore mm. because the ingredients just refuse mm-hmm. to submit yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. to what I want to express right. out of them. But um, you see, like that's another whole piece. That's right. It it's transports like that, you. Again, we keep jumping to movies, but it's like the food critic in Ratatouille at the end when he first takes the bite of the Ratatouille mm. and he's automatically transported to being home. Yeah. And 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 because it was a peasant right. food, and, there you and, go. and so he's he remembers his early childhood. It's powerful. Um, and no, because you guys were talking about the chef, but yeah. you know we've had like Asif Manvi on the show, and okay. today's special. Have you seen that movie? Not yet. Oh, you should because yeah. that movie is not a high end restaurant. It's actually a family okay. owned Indian Pakistani restaurant. Okay. That Asif Manvi, who is this. He goes to culinary school and mm-hmm. his dad runs this like rinky dink, yeah. you know, hole in the wall Pakistani restaurant. Oh, wait, no, Indian I have. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I, you're, yes, yeah. I have seen it. Right. And then he transforms it when the father ends up ill. Exactly. Yes, yeah, and no, he it's goes a great to movie. like the great teacher, yes. Nasiruddin Shah, yes, and he learns yes, yeah, yes. the secret, yes. whatever. So the spice it's like he's like the, the Zen master of yes, cooking. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but anyway, so, sorry. So as we, no, uh, as we wind things up, I did want to circle back around yeah. to you talked about Dalif and you said you wanted to. Well, actually yeah, before that. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure, sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. So just, okay. So there was that moment um, 10 years in and I was, in, I was um, invited to be on this uh, TV program that was going to air in Pakistan. It was, Somebody, um, his name, I'm not, yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, so he invited me, and um, I sat in this interview, and I was told that I could only speak in Urdu yeah. in the interview. and they. I were, saw that YouTube video, yeah. by the way. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I wanted to have like a Kaiser's, uh, what is it, Kaiser's? Soze? Soze moment, where, <laughs> okay. where where I just start speaking to you in like fluent Urdu. Uh, yeah. Like, huh, Lisa, Lisa Baji Urdu bhi bolti. Haan, and, like, full, <laughs> that's a little spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. No, no, seriously. Like Urdu I mean, uh Lisa Baji speaks like uh like immaculate. Ninety percent. No, you're I'm not Urdu. There yet, I saw that interview yeah, and it was like it was painful. No. <laughs> but see in that interview, okay. So it had been ten years. Yeah. And I 
got through to the end and he asked me to recite Al-Fatiha, which is a surah, uh, like a little chapter of the Quran. The opening chapter. The opening chapter, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And of course I knew it, but I was just like frozen. Okay. And my poor sister-in-law is, standing, is sitting in front of me. This is in Merchi at like two in the morning yeah, and yeah. she's mouthing it to me and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, wow. I couldn't like start it. I just couldn't. So he says, oh, let me start it with you. Mm-hmm. And so we started, of course, I could recite it. Yeah. But after that, and we stopped filming, and I realized, like, Allah put me on stage in front of a few million people. Mm-hmm. And it was like my test. Like, did I pass for myself, or do I feel like I need more? Mm. And in that moment, I, I did make a prayer that, you know, I need to know more. And mm. I'm just, I need to add weight to my practice, and I don't know how to do it. Okay. I've gotten myself as far as I can go. Um, but I just don't know how to get there. And he sent me to Tatlif. Like I literally, a few months later, my son, who at that time when was 16. When you say he, who, who's God. He? Oh, sorry. No, right. it's okay. Right. Yeah. Right. It's okay. I, I was, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I was just still no. thinking back to the no, no, host we, who put you on the spot. Yeah, no, he, what no, a yeah. patronizing It was sort of, uncomfortable, but it's, yeah. you know, it is what it is. And it, okay. I think there was a, re- again, yeah. I, I don't hold grudges. I mm. just didn't want to go down that path. But, mm, yeah. um, but basically, it was an experience that happened that I believe was meant to happen. Right. And but, then, yeah, so, go ahead. So this person, in essence, it's like jump through this hoop to prove to me that like that. He wanted his, I think his attention was good. Yeah. So when I, he had visited the restaurant, my sister-in-law at that time was a fan and called me and okay. said like, oh my God, so uh, so and so's here mm-hmm. and we're so excited. You have to come. And I was I just had a new baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was 11 years after my last baby. So it was like starting all over again. He was a few months old and I wasn't in any condition to go. <laughs> you guys have how many kids? We have five, mashallah. Five. And so it was like wow. three and we then you took three. a break and yeah. then the two ones. Yes. Yeah, the- so 11 years later we have, so we have our 1990 vintages and then our 2000 <laughs> vintage. <laughs> yeah. And you're trying to repeat. It seems like your you like you're, you I'm, could potentially so, so you're, like your husband's family. I get what no, we in did. a sense we because did. like yeah. if your oldest uh, not and to your wife have a have a have a <laughs> yeah. child soon enough. Yeah, exactly. no. But to be honest, my so my youngest and my oldest are 16 years apart. So I did d- redo my husband and his brother's relationship. Oh, there you go. Funny. So I'm interested wow. to see how that plays out. But to tie this up, yeah, um, no, I just feel bad because I know we got a lot. To, to get through and mm-hmm. not that much time. So um, so I go in and, and I sit at the table and it's that shock effect. I start speaking Urdu. Yeah. And then he's like, wait, wow. you speak Urdu? Yeah, okay. yeah I do. And you're, you're Muslim. Yeah, because at, at that point I didn't have a job. So I didn't, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm just saying I right. could not point out Lisa and say she's Muslim, right? Mm-hmm. I just look like any other average Caucasian woman. And I was like, yep. I am. And, and he wanted to know the whole story. And he said, I want Pakistanis to see that mm. in America, mm. right, somebody can be born here, raised here, fall in love with Pakistan and Islam. Mm-hmm. So to me, it was an ode to America. And that's why I agreed to do it. I really did think it was like a good way forward right. to kind of, again, build bridges of understanding between two countries that I both, I love both, right? That's right. I love America and I love Pakistan. Yeah. And I, I loved to see the bridge that he was crossing, trying to cross us over to. And so I did agree to that it. That is important because I think you, like, for example, you talked about what, you know, the post 9-11 reaction to sure. people when you say your husband's from Pakistan. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And equally present is when you go back home, yeah. or I'm sorry, when you go back to Pakistan or India or whatever, people are like, How, you know, are you safe? Right. Are you able to practice your yep, religion? Exactly. You know, are, are Muslims really being yep. persecuted and right. mosques are being burned down? Because yep. again, that's the narrative that's or right. that's the singular Perception. image that they're fed through the news. Same. Yeah. So the same. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. exactly so, the same. So in his, in this case, yes. he wanted to demonstrate the fact that, you know, not only is Islam like spreading and, and present right. in, in America, but here's this beautiful example of there like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that I, so, I say was a good intention. Right. And so, yeah. You know, I, I, I appreciated that, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so in that moment, yeah. I made da'a, I yeah. made a prayer, and God answered it. And my son, who was 16, was attending Tetlif. Mm. We lived down the street. That's what I was saying. I had no clue it existed. Really? Okay. Wow. Okay. So he's like, you have to come, you have to right. come. So I walked in. Okay. And sat down on the floor, very pretty close to the front, and sat and listened to Sama give his Sunday night right living right right. and it was like I I say this all the time but it was like I was so thirsty and I didn't know I was that thirsty and I just took a big gulp of his water 
And it was like, oh, this is what I've been, you know, waiting for. And he was talking in a way that I completely understood. I felt totally connected to it. There was a period when he had given the story of the prophet, peace be upon him, when his daughter was relaying about how he whispered in her ear. I'm I'm trying to run quick through this. No, no, please, take your time. And But it was in that moment that, you know, he had told her that he was passing soon Mm -hmm. and she cried. And then he whispered again and said, you know, you'll be the first person that I will see, you know, you'll see when you pass forward. And, Hmm. And in that moment, I just cried because he became a father to me. In that moment, he was not just, which he is, but it was like, it was a humanizing experience. I had always been taught that you couldn't talk about him. He was up high on the shelf, right? Wrapped up in a cloth (laughs) and you couldn't touch. And now like, right. Right. And suddenly here he was, this human father and and this beautiful, tender moment with his daughter. Father and daughter. And I related to it and, and it was just this. So there, there's been so many of these little, little micro experiences that I had in Tetleaf. And so how this is how I like to explain it, okay? Sure. I become Muslim. It's private. It's private for a long time. I then open Mirchi Cafe. Suddenly my Islam is, and I don't mean private as in people know I'm Muslim. Right. I mean, my experience to Islam was was very controlled right. environment, sure. right? And that's what I mean by private. I suddenly am put into the arena of public Muslims on a day-to-day basis, yeah. and it wasn't working that great. I wasn't the good front person for the restaurant mm. because in that time I wasn't in hijab. So people would walk in, be only me, and, oh, 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 is this not halal? And then they would leave, and I would run after them, and I would say, why could it not be halal? What, what is it about me that makes this food non-halal to you? Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, they get embarrassed, and then I'd, you know, be very polite and offer them <laughs> to come back inside. That was hard in yeah. that time. And then I started to build a bit of resentment like to people who looked religious. To me, it felt like a costume because wow. I'm like, hey, I'm Muslim too. Yeah. You know, like how come I'm not being invited into this party, <laughs> right? Yeah. So then you've got that experience as experience number two. Mm-hmm. I go into Tet Leaf and little by little micro experiences over the years, I feel like I've been able to learn enough mm-hmm. that when I do go, into these experiences. Like I went to the masjid a few years ago with my little, two little new ones, right? Mm. And I got yelled at. It's a long story. It was a really small thing, but one lady told me to sit here and I went to sit there and then the other lady didn't know that. And she's like, you're not supposed to sit here. You need to sit over there. The old me would have crumpled and like probably not left, but not come back often. Mm. The new me was like, um, sorry, so-and-so told me to come sit here. Mm -hmm. If you have a problem with that, you need to go talk to her. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) It gave me backbone and strength Mm -hmm. because now I was practicing in a way that I I understood. Mm -hmm. It was enough knowledge. Confidence and ownership of the tradition, right? Exactly. It's like, I can own this. This can be mine. Correct. Right. So, but when you're guarded because you're embarrassed that people aren't going to find out you don't know everything you're supposed to know, you tend to not you're kind of experiencing it through fear mm-hmm. and and almost a sh- like shame mm-hmm. and that never translates well for mm-hmm. anyone mm-hmm. so part of it i believe was again i don't say personally my fault but like i was i was maybe experiencing it from my base of fear mm-hmm. and shame yeah my reaction to other people's behavior yeah, right. was really more my problem that's right than it was even their problem and now that I've, you know, worked on that, and of course, every day we try to learn more, right? Keep adding weights, but um, I still feel like I'm at least for my own self, I don't feel shameful anymore mm. about, you, you understand? Like, no, I still absolutely. don't know everything. I'm right. still learning, and, but I've understood, like, not to work from a place of shame. That's right. And, and fear. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Tetleaf did that for me. So. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Well, I, think, I think that's a great end to put on this conversation right, <laughs> right. Um, we covered a lot we of covered ground. a lot of ground that's yes. right we did it was beautiful oh um, my goodness thank you thank you so much shukriya both both shukriya, <laughs> both, both shukriya. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any <laughs> can anybody find out maybe um, ways to engage you reach out to you check out you know yeah, sure. find out about your rest about your absolutely. culinary yeah absolutely i mean um Currently, we do have Merchi Cafe has a Facebook page, has Instagram page. Um, I have my personal page, which I don't 
like it's not an open open page, but if I know you well enough, I'll, <laughs> you know, you'll be a part of my page too. Sure. Um, and then we did start um, the Hunger Project. Please, thank and I just you. wanted Talk to throw that, that yeah, out because no, no, that's really our right. most I, important yeah. thing we're doing right now. Uh-huh. Um, and it's still like just starting. Okay. But basically, our goal is every Friday from twelve to three, we are um, making food boxes mm-hmm. that are a full meal for two to three people each box. And so a family can pick up to four boxes at, at a time. And the locations of pickup currently are Mirchi Fremont, okay. Lighthouse, Lighthouse Masjid. Beautiful. And then I'm forgetting the other masjid in, in Oakland. There's two of the okay. masjids. And, and again, we're open to different locations in the future. Um, and we're currently making about 150 boxes per Friday. We would love to bump that up. Um, at some point, you know, a lot of people have asked to participate with us. And we're just trying to get our feet wet in this. But at some point, yes, we'd love if community members wanted to volunteer or if they wanted to donate yeah. and so we could make more. Um, that's something for a future that we're working on and we'll be announcing that once we get a better understanding of it. Right. And yes. if people did want to contribute right now, how do they reach out to you? Like via the um, website, Lisa, Facebook maybe? or Yeah, um, either that or Lisa at MRGCafe.com. There you go. You know, yes. And for again, those who visit the Bay Area, I mean, those, I mean, we obviously have a lot of listeners who aren't local. Yes. But if you do visit, uh, make it a point to stop at one love, of their many locations. Yes, we have oh, two, two right. Mitchie Cafe locations, one in Fremont, one in Dublin. We would be more than happy to invite you into our family because we are one of the, you know, they're less um, family run businesses. Yeah. And so for us, it is a family endeavor. Nice. Come and be a part of our family. Thank you so much. And thank, uh, thank you. you, as always, uh, listeners, for listening. And if you want to engage us, uh, reach out to us. Uh, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can visit our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. If you like the show, support the show. Please um, share the word. Spread the word about the show. Visit our Patreon page and uh, become a patron of the show. And if you want to engage Zucky, you can find Zucky at? You can find me on Twitter at Zucky's Corner, Z-A-K-I-S Corner. It's also my website, just at com. I want to thank Hub925 once again for making our recording space available. I want to thank Amar in the booth for running audio for us. And uh, Pervez? Yeah, I mean, and I, thank you for reminding me about the Hub again. And it's not only great to be here, but, uh, you know, Diffuse Congruence is proudly sponsored by the Hub Foundation. Um, Hub Foundation hosts live talks by Karen Armstrong, Noam Chomsky, Hamza Yusuf, among many other luminaries um, that share the space here at Hub925 in Pleasanton. Uh, thank you once again, everybody, for listening. And thank you to our guest, Lisa Ahmed. Thank you to my partner, Pervez Ahmed. My name is Zaki Hassan. This has been Diffuse Congruence. We'll catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.